Right, uh, good morning everybody and welcome to our, our fourth lecture um, on molecular modeling. I do hope that um, at this stage you've had managed to construct some ligands and to do some optimizations, um, either using XDB, which is really, really fast, uh, or using Gaussian, which is slow but more accurate, but at least one of the two, and uh, ideally be uh, you will be able to use both of those um, to optimize ligands to a high quality. Now, of course, um, we, we have used molecular mechanics. We spoke about molecular mechanics yesterday, but of course, certainly uh, in the cleanup of molecules and the conformational searches with the Marvin sketch, there is uh, molecular mechanics involved. And so um, the lovely geometries you're getting have been from molecular mechanics. Uh, we are going to use, when we come to molecular docking, uh, we are going to, it, it's not quite the same as molecular mechanics, but it's very close in the way energies are calculated. Uh, so just keep molecular mechanics at the back of your mind. Certainly if you want to, they are more involved, uh, if you're doing confirmational searches, uh, almost all the energies that uh, are calculated are calculated at the mechanic, molecular mechanics level of theory. So just a quick uh, point about uh, conformational searches. Yeah, um, you already, as chemists, you know very well about uh, the conformational energy surface. And I've got uh, the conformational, I've got an energy surface for butane, where the, uh, uh, the uh, degree of freedom is the torsional angle. But of course, in conformational searches, it doesn't have to be angled. It could be bonds. It could be multiples. You could have multiple dimensional uh, potential energy surfaces, changing two bonds, changing a bond and angle, changing two angles, for instance. Um, and that will normally be um, on your x-axis. And of course, then on your y, you will have your energy profile um, as you change whatever you're changing um, uh, or as you run through conformations on your x-axis. So a conformational search is uh, good to do. Um, so um, there are other programs that can do it. I know we've got a license for Marvin Sketch, but if, uh, another program that I use is uh, Vega ZZ. And Vega ZZ provide a license um, at no cost uh, for academic work. And so you can easily get it, you can download it. But uh, one thing I like about Vega ZZ is that when you do a conformational search, it is very clear that it's doing a conformational search. And so what you, once you constructed your molecule in Vega ZZ, uh, you specify, for example, where you want uh, bonds to be rotated. You can see that um, I've specified in this case that three bonds can be rotated. And so it will search for all iterations, maybe with six positions here, six positions here, six positions here for a total of 216 conformers. It'll set those angles, um, calculate the energy. And once it's calculated the energy, uh, it will then uh, pick out the lowest energy conformer at the end of it. Of course, uh, you have to be very careful because the larger your molecule, uh, the longer and the more uh, torsion angles you have, the longer it's going to take. And for uh, even medium to large size molecules, uh, it will take too long for a computer to search through all conformations systematically in this way. So you have to just be uh, cautious how you do it. But of course, if you're doing conformational, if you're searching for conformations in Marvin Sketch and you have got a big molecule, um, I recommend that you lengthen uh, your search for confirmations. So uh, I think it'll pick out 10 confirmations by default, change that to 1,000 or 10,000, and make sure uh, that you do that confirmational search thoroughly uh, because there are just so many confirmations available to big molecules. Okay, so uh, that confirmation is uh, what we in this course, what we're largely using uh, molecular mechanics for. Uh, but of course, we've been generating high quality structures uh, using uh, quantum mechanical calculations. And so we've all done 
QM calculations at this point. Okay, so um, when you do a quantum mechanical, an approximate quantum mechanical calculation on your molecule, uh, it tries to calculate the energy, uh, energy uh, dependent on the positions of the nuclei, but of course taking the electrons, the electrons involved in the calculation. And of course, you can then change the nuclei to get the lowest energy from a QM point of view. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so uh, examples of QM based methods include uh, density functional theory. This is actually a hybrid density functional theory method, B3LYP, and we've already used that in Gaussian. Uh, and we've got this basis set that we need to discuss as well. So there's a flavor of quantum mechanics we've got, and there's a basis set. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, some quantum mechanics are truly ab initio calculations, which means you don't need anything, you don't need to know anything else but um, how many electrons are in the system um, and where the nuclei are, and you can calculate the energy. That's uh, from first principles, it'll use quantum mechanics straight the way through, um, and those are termed ab initio methods. Um, density functional theory and semi empirical aren't quite ab initio methods. Um, semi empirical is even less so because there are some parameters, empirical parameters that are included to make the, the calculation go faster. So it's not truly from scratch, it's not truly. Um, <clears throat> just using the Schrodinger wave equation to calculate the energy um, of a system. So these are based on quantum mechanics, but they're not truly ab initio uh, because there are parameters that are included um, to aid the calculation. Okay, empirical parameters. Uh, the XTB that we used uh, uh, using uh, the uh, semi empirical type binding is another semi empirical method, but it's a more modern method and I highly recommend it. So um, I know in this department, we've recently had a paper uh, where uh, as that XTV calculations were used um, on a really big, on a nanoparticle. It was huge on a huge system. So that XTV is really powerful, particularly if you've got lots of atoms. Okay, so uh, please, um, and I think that uh, it's, it's a very, very modern method, uh, the XTB. Uh, the AM1 <clears throat> is still quite useful. It's very fast as well, uh, but it's a, an older an older method. Um, and I'm not sure it scales quite so well as XTB to many, many atoms. Okay. Right, so we've already done some editing of Gaussian files. And of course, you'll know in the, uh, uh, that you have this uh, line uh, where you tell it to optimize. And of course, after telling to optimize, you tell it the theory that you want. So you can tell it, you could do an AM1. If you typed opt in AM1, your, it's a semi-empirical calculation and your run will be finished in minutes. Um, or it'll be finished really, really quickly. Uh, of course, we've done B3LIP, the hybrid density functional theory calculations. And these uh, B3LIP, calculations took quite a while. Now we'll speak of basis sets and we just use a, a medium sized basis set but if you wanted even more accurate results you could take a larger basis set, we'll discuss basis sets um, and of course your calculation would then take longer uh, but of course your limit then is your theory. Is Are you using a very accurate uh, level of theory? Um, uh, you're pushing that theory to the limits, the bigger the basis set you, you put. Okay. So when you use Gaussian, uh, the uh, QM methods, the methods that you have available to you are uh, in this table. Uh, and just be aware that as you move down this table, it's going to take a lot more time. This is the theory side of things. So it's the left hand side, CB3 LYP. See, you can see you can use molecular mechanics. You can use AM1, semi empirical AM1 in uh, Gaussian. Uh, Hartree Fock is a little bit, takes more time, it's a little bit more accurate than the semi empirical methods. DFT methods are very popular, 
that uh, they can take more or less the same time as HF. Some, some take are faster, some are slower. Hybrid are slower. Um, uh, and that's this here is about the, <laughs> is the most popular balance for accuracy. Because as you get down here, yes, you get more and more accurate, but of course your time for calculations uh, takes longer. So if I said to you, right, you need to submit your molecules and do them at the, uh, maybe the uh, QCISD, uh, maybe we would finish this course in, uh, in a few months' time. So, uh, uh, so uh, particularly for the size of molecules we're gonna use. So it's no point in going to this level of accuracy if you're not gonna get your results in time. And most researchers find DFT as the perfect balance between accuracy and time. So they don't, don't go too deep and don't go too high, but get that balance of time and accuracy. Um, because uh, if you wait too long for your results, your accurate results aren't worth anything because your degree is already over. Okay. Right, so just to give you, um, I just want to, not to scare you, but just to try and make you aware why QM methods take so long. <clears throat> and QM methods, and, and maybe you'll get a bit of insight as to why some empirical methods go a little bit faster. Um, they're still doing QM, uh, but there are approximations that have to come into quantum mechanics in order for us to get a calculation on a big on, on, on any molecule, so you may be aware of the Schrodinger uh, equation from undergraduates, um, from undergraduate work, um, and of course, the Hamiltonian in, in uh, the Schrodinger equation. Really, uh, when you're looking at a molecule, you're looking at the uh, kinetic energy of the nuclei, the kinetic energy of electrons, and of course, the interactions: nuclear, nuclear interactions, nuclear electron interactions and electron-electron interactions. So here are my three nuclei in my molecule. You can see my electrons. <clears throat> and I've drawn in red the interactions, the three interactions between nuclei. Uh, I've drawn in darker blue. Can you see there are lots of lines? I've drawn in darker blue the interactions between nuclei and electrons. And the very light lines are the interactions between electrons and electrons. And I hope that you notice that there are many interactions, even in this tiny system that only has four electrons and three nuclei. Now you can imagine as your molecule gets bigger, the number of interactions uh, increases exponentially. It really uh, increases in a, a, a large way. So just as an example, you could think of water. How many nuclei do you have in water? You've got three nuclei in water. You've got two hydrogens and oxygen nucleus. And then how many electrons do you have? Um, think about that. I think you've got 10 electrons in water. So how many interactions have you got uh, from one nuclei to the other? I think there are three interactions. How many interactions between nuclei and electrons? I think you're looking at 30. And how many interactions between one electron and another electron? I think there are about 90 of them. So there are a huge number of interactions that need to be addressed uh, when solving the Schrodinger wave equation. Of course, you've also got the kinetic energy of electrons, kinetic energy of neutrons. So um, this here is a Hamilton. This is the exact form of the Hamiltonian. This is a kinetic energy operator, etc. All uh, not uh, the. Uh, this is to do with the kinetic energy of electrons, kinetic energy of the uh, nuclei, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem is that you put that into the Schrodinger equation for a molecule, and it becomes impossible to solve. Um, I hope you're terrified by this because uh, mathematicians are also uh, quite scared of this because we're not going to get an exact result uh, if we put this in and we try and apply this to water. So we need a strategy in order to solve that and the strategy is to solve it approximately. Uh, and the first approximation, um, I'll speak a bit about the, I'll speak about the Hartree-Fock method um, as the uh, most straightforward form of uh, uh, I've heard it called vanilla quantum mechanics. Um, but the first approximation that can be done is Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which is done in several cases, not just Hartree-Fock. 
uh, it assumes that nuclear is stationary, which means that you can cut out the kinetic energy term for nuclear. And it assumes that electrons are doing all the movement, so let's worry about the electrons. Uh, to chemists, this makes sense. Uh, we know in terms of reactivity and uh, properties of uh, molecules that the electrons are very, very important. And so you can, you can make this a little bit simpler. Of course, the interaction of, electron, of nuclei with each other, you can take that term out. And so you end up with something that is a little bit simpler. You still have to worry about the interaction between electrons and nuclei. So you have to sum over all electrons, sum over all nuclei. And you have to also take into account electron, electron interactions to so sum over all electrons, sum over electrons that are not same as the first. And so you still have those terms, and it makes the uh, Hamiltonian operator a little bit simpler. Okay. So what that does <coughs> is it cuts down. Um, we still have the Schrodinger wave equation to solve, but of course we've got a slightly simpler form of it uh, to work with. So, and the wave function we get is an electronic wave function, not a wave function for the entire molecule. Okay. Of course, we still assume the nuclei is stationary, but right at the end, when you've solved everything and you get an energy, you get an energy value out. This is an eigenvalue equation. You operate. You've got to find the wave function for those electrons. You get an energy out. You'll then have to just add that nuclear repulsion term at your energy right at the end. But of course, it makes the system a little bit simpler, but it's still a little bit tough. <coughs> this particular uh, it's still quite tough to, uh, to solve. And so uh, the second thing that's done, the second approximation done is a Hodge-Bock approximation. In instead of trying to find a wave function for all electrons, what we do is we approximate the wave function for all electrons as a product of one electron wave functions. And I really like this approximation because it seems to match my view of a molecule which are, where all the electrons are in their own orbitals. So what you get at the end of this is you get a wave function for each electron. You get an orbital. At the end of this calculation, you get an orbital. It's uh, not quite that simple because um, electrons are fermions and they're anti-symmetric and so you have to have a, uh, the form has to be a little bit uh, so that exchange of electrons uh, it negates the wave functions. But don't worry about that. Okay. And then what happens is that you um, then uh, solving a whole lot of littler equations that are uh, more manageable. And this is the uh, Fock operator. Okay. So in the Hartree Fock method, so you can see this is like a miniature Schrodinger wave equation. Uh, the Fock operator for each electron includes a mean field of other electrons. Uh, it's a problem in Hartree Fock is that uh, you're not treating the other electrons. If you've got an electron of interest, you're not treating the other electrons uh, individually. You're not allowing them to move around. <clears throat> you're treating them as a cloud. And so your electron of interest is moving through that cloud <clears throat> and it's coming much closer to other electrons as than they should. So the energy is higher in that particular method. So. Uh, just be careful of some approximate Q methods. Um, there may be issues with the approximations that are drawn in. Okay. But um, a third approximation that's uh, perhaps the most important to explore is the LCA approximation. And again, this is another approximation that makes perfect sense to a chemist because when we try and make pi bonds uh, we know that to create a pi bond, you have overlap of two uh, p orbitals. So the pi bonding molecular orbital is a, an overlap. It's a combination of the p orbitals, the atomic orbitals. And of course, we know that if you have two atomic orbitals and they overlap, uh, the possibilities are you have a pi bonding or a pi antibody. So the linear combination plus or minus of those p orbitals of those atomic orbitals gives us the bonding molecular orbitals and this is quite nice because the linear co combination of, uh, of atomic orbitals approximation 
what we do is you have a molecule. How do you build up your wave functions, your one electron wave functions? How, how do you make a shape um, of a molecular orbital? Well, what you do is you look at your individual atoms and each individual atoms can bring its atomic orbitals to the mix. And of course, your molecular orbital is going to be a linear combination of those atomic orbitals. Okay, so just to kind of illustrate it, so you see here, um, this is ethanol. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital for, for ethanol. But how would we make that shape? Uh, mathematically, that's an, uh, I, I don't even know of a function that would produce such a beautiful pattern as we see there. However, if we work in terms of atomic orbitals, um, then we can, or uh, let's maybe be a little bit more general, and not just say atomic orbitals, but maybe say atomic functions, then we can build up that shape quite nicely. Can you see that, that perfectly spherical shape on that hydrogen over there? That's like an, uh, an S shape, an S uh, function. Uh, that is part of the contribution to it. See that there's a, a P function on that carbon. There's a P function here on that oxygen. There's a sp perfectly spherical S function on that hydrogen. Oh, this is interesting. There's another smaller S function on that hydrogen. An S, uh, another, if you remember, we had an S function on that hydrogen. He has a bigger S function on that hydrogen. P a smaller P function on the oxygen, compare it with that one. Uh, a P function on that carbon, S function on the hydrogen, an even bigger S function on the hydrogen, and another S function on that hydrogen. If you add all of those together in the right proportion, all those atomic functions, you get a very, very good approximation of that uh, highest occupied molecular orbital for ethanol. Okay, so what we have is that if we want a molecular orbital it is a sum of atomic functions and i'm not saying it's a sum of atomic orbitals here because we know uh, that uh, with hydrogen we would only have one s uh, orbital and so what i'm i've got is two s functions for that uh, we would have one one s orbital uh, but i've got two of these s functions that gives it some detail um, uh, within the highest occupied molecular orbital so don't just look at the surface but notice that as you go in there's going to be that variation as you go in where it's going to be uh, quite strong from the big one then weaker then strong from the smaller one so you've got all that detail so the molecular orbital is a sum of atomic orbitals okay so <clears throat> a basis set, a basis set is a sum of functions that create these shapes. Okay, so um, the smallest basis set that is around, um, I'm going to cut down from 3Ds into two into one dimension actually, just to give you an idea. But um, you can imagine that if you've got a cross section through uh, a 1S orbital, uh, the orange line is really how the uh, wave function goes. You would square it to get the actual uh, electron probabilities. So uh, you would have a strong intensity by the nucleus and it will weaker and it weaken as you move away from that. Of course, the slater type orbital is quite is in itself a, a, a complex uh, function. A, a complex mathematical function. Uh, I mean, complex as in uh, not. It, it's it's a tough one to work in, is what I'm meaning. Um, and so, it's found that if you work with Gaussian functions, if you've done stats, you know about Gaussian functions. Gaussian functions are very easy to work with on computers. So, the overlap of Gaussian functions is another Gaussian function, for instance. So, they're very easy and very uh, rapid to work with. And so what is found is that you can, if you overlap this tiny little Gaussian function, this medium Gaussian function, this long one, you add those three together, it makes this uh, lighter orange line that matches an atomic orbital beautifully well. 
So the density going from the nucleus coming out is very well. So these three functions match the uh, complicated uh, mathematical function that we have there. But of course, these three functions are easy to work with in computers. And so it's far more efficient to have these three Gaussian functions to work with. Uh, so the minimal basis set is the STO3G um, and will have three functions to match a slate. So it's three Gaussian functions to match every slater type orbital. But of course, minimal basis sets don't give accurate results, even though we are matching that. Uh, remember that um, when you've got atoms that move together, of course, your um, orbitals, are, uh, you're not going to have exactly, uh, there are going to be changes uh, to the system. So we, the more functions we have available, the more accurate we can get the molecular orbitals. For accurate work, um, we use sets of atomic functions that include different sizes of uh, P and S functions. So for example, if you only include a, a small P function on your atoms, um, if those P's are overlapping to make a sigma bond, uh, your results will be extremely accurate. But of course, if they are overlapping sideways to make a pi bond, your results will not be accurate. So what do we do? Should we use a large P, or P functions for the atoms? Yes, you could do that. And then your pi, pi uh, molecular orbitals that are formed are highly accurate, but all your sigmas are wrong because your P's are too large. So in practice, what we do is we use both. We use small and large. And so uh, we'll get the lowest energy. We'll get the best energy when we use the correct proportion of whichever size. So if we use more of the uh, smaller ones for sigma bonds, we'll get a lower energy. If we use more of the larger ones for pi bonds, we'll get a lower energy. So that'll work out quite nicely. Okay. And so you can always tell these, they're called double zeta basis sets, where you've got the two sizes, the large and small sizes together. And you saw that um, on the water that I showed you, where you've got the two different sizes of P function. Uh, you'll see the three one here, the double, the two numbers together mean it's a, a double zeta basis set. They're two different sizes uh, of uh, functions. Uh, if you come across a basis set that has 6311, G, they are three different sizes, even more accurate, last three possible sizes uh, in your, as a contribution towards the molecular orbitals. Okay, so those are, uh, we should at least, at the very least, use a double zeta basis set. So remember, we used 631GD yesterday and the day before, so uh, we, we, we're on a good track. Okay, now of course, there's also polarization functions are very important. So if you've got a hydrogen atom that only has S functions available to it, you can only have electrons symmetrically around the hydrogen atom. But if you provide to that hydrogen atom a P function, the sum of those means that on the left-hand side, you've got more, and the right-hand side cancels out, you've got less. You allow electron density to be polarized, to be on one side of the atom. And similarly, if you've got a heavy atom that only has P functions, give it a D function as well. And then it allows electron density to be polarized to be on one side. So this uh, D uh, side on that uh, means a polarization function. And this is exactly the basis set we used yesterday with B3LYP. That basis set we used um, is a dou double zeta basis set. It's got two different sizes of P functions, for instance. And it's got polarization on your heavy atoms. It's got a D function on your heavy atoms to allow for polarization. So that's why uh, the basis set we used yesterday is, is fine, it's reasonable. Okay. Okay, if you work with anions or if you work with transition states, you might need to have your electrons far away from atoms. So you might need to have big functions that allow your electrons to be far from atoms and the plus. Uh, shows it, and so diffuse functions are available to us as well. Okay, um, so purple style basis sets normally have this form here. Uh, they are K and L, M, G, and you can see that uh, core orbitals are described with some Gaussian functions. Uh, the valence are uh, described with some other numbers, 
that's diffuse functions and of course the new polarization functions. So you can see here is a very large basis set for very accurate results, in which case we've got a, a triple split balance, it's a triple zeta basis set. There are lots of diffuse functions, there are lots of polarization functions to get highly accurate results. Okay. And so don't forget that the reason we have a basis set is for the LCO approximation, in which case we will get the uh, uh, molecular orbitals as being the sum of atomic, uh, sum of the basis functions. Okay. Right. Um, just um, just to uh, let you know that uh, I'm not going to go too much in it, uh, but uh, uh, the whole process, um, for instance, even is an iterative process. It takes a long time. So um, <clears throat> with um, Hartree-Fock, for instance, you have your coordinates of your atomic nuclei. You have to then guess what your molecular orbitals are going to be like and then try it out and you find it's not right, quite right, and you have to go around and iterate several times until there's no further change until you get the lowest energy. And so if you look at your log files, you'll see uh, that it goes around several times. And of course, once you've got the lowest possible energy, then you know you are at the right uh, molecular orbital. Okay. Um, just in some methods, of course, that uh, just note there are problems with some methods. I don't want to go too much into it, uh, but some methods that you get closer and closer to an accurate result, but some methods will never get you to an exact result. So Hartree Fock is not a good method to use. It, it, it will never get you to the exact correct energy. Uh, it will get you quite close. Uh, as you get your basis set, you'll get better and better, but you'll never get exactly there. So be careful what uh, QM you work with. Um, and just also be aware that as you get more and more accurate, as you get more and more accurate, you are going to be slower and slower. So it's going to be, uh, you need to have a good balance between that. And of course, the uh, good balance normally is density functional theory, uh, which includes many flavors. So B3LYP is quite old. I think it's over 30 years old. Uh, there are more accurate methods that, uh, so this is quite a nice one that I've used quite well. It takes about the same amount of time, but of course is much better. It's got, uh, includes dispersion, which um, B3LIP does not include. Um, and DFT methods have a good trade-off. And these are the two that we've been using so far. So please stick with them. Use density functional or semi-empirical. Uh, particularly if you've got lots of compounds to work with, use semi-empirical. If you've got only a few, go for, uh, you could even go for uh, Omega B97XD. It's a quite nice one to work with. Okay. Um, there are many other density functionals and you can look into them if you like. Uh, uh, there are poles and so you can see that B3LIP is used quite a bit. But I recommend that if you are using it in, in your work, uh, please search the literature and see what has been used in your line of work and follow, follow the literature uh, because some of these are appropriate, uh, more appropriate to different situations uh, than other situations. So some, some of these are for periodic systems, which we're not using. Some are for more organic, which we are. So you, you just need to be careful which one you choose. Okay, right. Uh, so here is an example. And so, uh, for reaction barriers, you can see this is what uh, in the poll what many researchers were using uh, for people who were working with um, heavy transition elements, and this is what they were pre uh, preferring. People who are interested in geometry, like we are, this is what they're using, and you see this B3LYP right there. Okay, so just be careful, search the literature, and just make sure you use the right flavor of density functional theory for the problem you're trying to work with. Okay, and of course we, we've got uh, semi-empirical uh, is also what we've done. Please include semi-empirical type binding. Okay, I'm not going to uh, speak too much more. I'm going to stop it at this point. Um, and then in 10 minutes, at quarter two, uh, we're going on to the practice, which will be slightly different. We still haven't caught up to our practice in the lectures, um, but we'll, we're getting ahead in practice that when, when the lectures, when we 
come up to it, uh, we know exactly what's going on. Okay, so I'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, before I go, any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll see you in 10 minutes.